Today we have not a cloud in the sky, uh, and yet we have flooding on one of our streets uh, here in Norfolk. It was sunny outside, not a raindrop in sight, uh, completely impassable because of the tides. So what we're seeing now are what they call perigee and high tides. They're the fall high tides. So we get sea level rise, then we get the normal tide cycle, and then annually we get these even higher tides. We've got tidal flooding and we've got precipitation flooding. And when they both hit at the same time, it is literally the perfect storm. Salt water that's coming in as the tide has risen and coming up through the storm drain, it's serving as an inflow uh, for, uh, for salt water. What happens is it actually picks up all of the pollutants off the road and off lawns, stirs it all up, and then you've got this soup of just nasty polluted water. Um, and people can actually get sick from it. I actually just talked to a guy who pulled into the parking lot. He's been here 20 years. He said, this used to happen maybe once a year. Now it happens every few months. Or in this case, it's happened, it's happened in the last week about four times. Um, kids can't get home from school. People can't get home from work. We can't get 40 or 50,000 sailors on and off the largest naval base in the world. There are a lot of unique things here that are extremely valuable, critical infrastructure, essential to the nation's defense. We have the highest rate of sea level rise on the East Coast here. It's been measured at about 18 inches over the last century. And now every day with every tide, the water comes higher and higher. That risk is increasing um, and, it, and we are already seeing impacts here in the surrounding communities. So in Southeast Virginia, the government's got together and said, okay, by 2050, we're gonna get a foot and a half of sea level rise. By 2080, we're gonna get three feet. And by end of century, we're going to get four feet plus. So if you came back here in 2050 and you imagine a foot and a half higher, you're not going to be able to use this road. The issue uh, is much more immediate than, than 2100. And, and the problem with using that date uh, is that it lulls people today into thinking that we don't have to worry about this immediately. It's an insidious, sneak up on you kind of disaster that comes along at the rate of, of millimeters a year, but it compounds as it goes. Obama issued an executive order that reached across the federal government in 2015, and it basically set a new flood standard for all federal agencies and all federal activities, and it was a step forward. 10 days before Harvey hit Houston, Trump rescinded that executive order. They may not believe in human-caused climate change, but Sea level rise is irrefutable. The awareness here is so high that the region is saying, look, I can't wait for the feds or the state. We're going to take action. What we're doing uh, with Catch the King and the Citizen Science Project as an opportunity to, you know, to allow folks to kind of peer into the future. And the data that, you know, is collected by our volunteers uh, will be extremely useful over time in improving flooding forecasts, uh, making them much more granular, you know, accurate, by the block. So every five or so feet, a user would tap on a button on their phone to mark that GPS location. So we're measuring not the depth of the water, um, as some people might think, but the reach of the water. So how far does this water reach into your neighborhood or into your yard or over your street? And enable people who live in places like this to, you know, look at a, at a model and say, you know, maybe I better move my car tonight, get it in a spot where I know I'm going to be able to get out tomorrow morning. We've developed a phone app and the purpose is to try to figure out where the flooding is but also to show people where the flooding will be on a regular basis. I think it's no secret that the um, existential threat that uh, Norfolk faces is sea level rise. We are um, second only, only to New Orleans and um, so our focus is how are we going to uh, not just survive, but how are we going to thrive? Some of our um, highest priced properties are on the coastline, but also some of the most vulnerable neighborhoods are dealing with flooding uh, just because the infrastructure was never created there. You know, what we're doing is buying time in a lot of these areas, and so we're having to make investments in, you know, seawalls, mitigation, and the rest, you know, long after this road is a foot underwater, somebody's gonna show up with a bulldozer to fix it. 
challenge at the federal level is they can't isolate themselves from the surrounding communities. They can't just protect their own uh, property. Just yesterday, the Navy was basically scrubbed of doing any climate change work. Unfortunately, human nature sort of lends us to be that way, that um, there's, there's a reluctance to commit a lot of money to something that's kind of hard to get your hands on, because the longer we wait to start to make decisions, the more costly those decisions will be and the fewer outcomes we'll have. We are in the middle of this crisis right now. It has already started. And uh, uh, if we wait until we see cataclysmic evidence of it, it will be too late to do anything about it. Uh, it's the, the nature of the problem is so huge, so tectonic in its scale, that uh, we have to start building solutions today. But here in Hampton Roads, we're, we're living with this now. This, this is happening now. We are, people here know when Monday afternoon here this week, when we had a sort of a mini nor'easter and an unexpectedly high tide, people, you know, which roads can't you go down? How do I get from here to there? When's the tide gonna be high? People start thinking about that. That's a change. Norfolk is a city of the water. And if we try to wall the water off from the city, haven't we changed who we are and how we think about things? And um, is, is that something worth doing? But the irony that we now face is that that, that thing that has for so long provided us sustenance is now poised to erase us. I don't know, every time a hurricane comes through here, I think it's gonna be the trigger. But six months after the hurricane's through, people are still building houses along the shoreline. I remember uh, wading through my basement chest deep and, uh, and reflecting as I tried to get the power to my sump pump that uh, the time had come probably for me to think about moving on. When you talk about a personal story for me, I've got three kids. They're going to grow up and they're going to be dealing with this far longer than I am. And shame on us if we're not addressing this now. We're right at the cusp of where uh, the acceleration is going to become really evident. You have to be optimistic because the alternative is, is uh, unlivable. The big uh, challenge for this area, which, will be, which is a challenge for any area that undergoes it, is a big storm. What would a big storm do here? It's not an if, it's a when. There's going to be a huge storm and catastrophic event. It will affect Norfolk, it will affect the region. I believe we will be better prepared because we're working towards that. But it's the citizens going to their elected officials and saying, do something, get something done here. Um, and it, this is a nonpartisan issue. This is not something that depends on which side of the political aisle you're on. This is impacting everyone here. Two thirds of our population uh, lives on the coast. And uh, uh, so you've got to hope that the folks that we've put in power to look out for them recognize that, uh, that there's a real dilemma here, that it's existential.